Welcome back. In this section of the class, we're going to discuss cross-sectional designs. Cross-sectional designs are designs where we don't have a time element. All of our measurement happens at the same period in time, in just one period in time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing cross-sectional designs because they're relatively weak types of designs. They're what we would use if we didn't have any other uh, way of doing things. Still, they're, they're quite common uh, in several fields, including public administration, and you see them used quite a lot. And so I think it's worth our time to consider some of the challenges of cross-sectional designs as well as some of the ways that we handle uh, common issues in the area. So turning to the first slide, uh, there are three features of cross-sectional designs. As I said, in the first slide, there's no time dimension. All of our measurement occurs at one period in time. Uh, th what this produces is a situation where it's very difficult to sort out temporal precedence issues, and we'll see this in just a little bit. Um, we also are relying on existing differences rather than change, so we're looking at differences between units as a way to try and point out some type of relationship rather than looking at how something changes over time or in response to a specific treatment in a randomized experiment. Uh, also, groups are formed in cross-sectional designs based on existing differences rather than from random assignment as with an experimental design. And so in a lot of cases, the groups have been chosen or self-selected into this situation, which creates uh, again, lots of threats based upon selection biases and selection interactions. Now, the basic uh, cross-sectional research design is shown in this slide. Uh, we have our uh, observation occurring all at one point in time on the right-hand side here. Uh, and it comes after some type of treatment. Now, we don't need more than one unit to be treated. And, and what I should mention is these groups tend to be units. Uh, so these might be different cities, different individuals, different school districts. There's some type of a, a unit of analysis is our different groups. And so what we're looking at is differences among the groups at a one point in time as a way to be able to assess causality. Now these treatments, XB and XC here, don't have to be necessarily treatments. They can be no treatment or a different treatment or different levels of the treatment. One of the problems with, uh, with uh, cross-sectional design is it's very difficult to sort out who has received the treatment and who hasn't received the treatment. And so we might say that a city hasn't undergone a certain change uh, prior to making an observation of something like crime or something like that. However, what really might have happened is they received a different level of the treatment. Uh, maybe they had a different, slightly different force, but a very common uh, or similar force uh, to what uh, the city in question uh, experienced. And so this again presents some issues. So what are the threats to cross-sectional research designs? Well, the fundamental one is we're trying to establish cause without a time element or without, without a change element involved. A lot of times what results from cross-sectional designs, quite frankly, is correlation instead of causation. We aren't able to necessarily first establish temporal precedence or second, able to sort out alternative explanations for the effect we think we see. Now, in terms of dealing with the uh, alternative explanations, one of the things we can do is use statistical controls. As I mentioned like, a couple classes ago, uh, there are different ways to control or assess the likelihood of alternative explanations. Uh, there's mechanical controls like in an experiment in a lab where we literally control everything. Uh, there's randomized assignments, so we're randomizing in order to create pretest equivalents, in other words, controlling for different factors. But when we, can, when we can do neither of those, what we have to rely on are statistical controls. 
And so what we do here is we enter variables into a statistical model that serve as proxies or controls for a certain characteristic. So if it's a city and we're trying to measure the effect of a policing, uh, new policing model on crime, um, one of the important control variables is going to be the economy, state of the economy. And this brings up an important point is when do we have enough variables in the model? When do we have enough control variables in order to uh, say something about cause and effect relationship? There is no right answer. There's no magic number like 12 out there. Um, what we must do instead is use a priori models. And this, so this is where our literature review comes in, as I said in the, the first lecture. Um, we need to go out and scan the existing literature to find out what variables are important, so we put them into our model. In other words, the, the causal maps, again, is another huge, this is another huge use of uh, causal maps, is which control variables we have to uh, enter. Um, even with this in place, we still, in most cases, can't assess the temporal precedence issue, or we can't get at the temporal precedence issue. Causal direction is a lingering pro problem. Does X cause Y, or does Y cause X? Was, is it the chicken or the egg that came first? This is very difficult in a cross-sectional design, if not impossible. A lot of times you just have to rely on theory and uh, observation. The other thing with respect to, I guess it's kind of an external validity issue, um, uh, is we inevitably, when we do cross-sectional research, I would argue when we do any research, but, but certainly with cross-sectional research, we have to simplify. And in simplifying, we may lose meaning. We might lose context and depth of meaning. So it's one thing to say that a person's job experience affects their likelihood of becoming unemployed. But it's another thing to use that job experience variable as meaning some great thing about um, you know, what people get from jobs. Um, we're using it simply to measure something which we think it, it reflects uh, in, in society or in our, our context. And so inevitably we have, to, uh, we have to simplify. Now some people aren't very comfortable with this, and, and so they turn to methods which are, tend to be small n type methods, small sample size type methods like qualitative research. And we, they try and tease out, uh, almost in an anthropological way, the entire context of a specific situation. Uh, Again, I have concerns about that simply because I think it's, op it's very open to exception fallacies. Uh, but I understand that people also have objections, uh, you know, significant and, and I think uh, ju perhaps justified uh, questions about how much simplification goes on. My take on it is very simple, and that's we should rely on replication in both cases, in all cases. Um, if I find that job experience affects unemployment rate in, in one study, but somebody doesn't find it in another study, well, then a theory which relates the two uh, has been falsified. And so if we really believe in falsification and hypothesis testing, we should be for replication, trying to you know, replicate our results in many different contexts and in many different situations so that we get meaning uh, over time. Uh, and but that's just my take on it. I'm, I'm sure you have your own opinions, and certainly there are enough opinions in the academic literature in order to justify almost any uh, situation. So or any take on it. So that's it for cross-sectional design. Like I said, I'm not going to uh, harp on it a lot. Um, we're next going to move on and talk about case study design because it's very commonly used in our field. Thank you very much.